Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will develop the structure theory of uh, semi-simple Lie algebras. So, we will begin with the definition of uh, toral subalgebras. So, first we will make a remark. Suppose uh, you start with uh, this G which is uh, let us say finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra. So, then uh, if it actually consists only uh, nilpotent elements that means add nilpotent elements okay. If add x is nilpotent for all g nilpotent elements. So, then using Ingle's theorem we can conclude that g must be nilpotent. So, in that case, so g must be properly containing this its derivative algebra, but we already know that for semi simple E algebra uh, we do not have this uh, information, we have g equal to the derivative algebra of g. So, that actually leads to contradiction. So, that means not all elements are add nilpotent elements. So, in particularly, so we can actually uh, if we talk about this what is called this abstract Jordan decomposition. So, there exists some element x in g such that, so this x will have it is a semi simple and nilpotent parts ok, x s plus x n you can write where this x s is the semi simple part we can assume it to be non-zero. Now, uh, since uh, this G contains uh, both its uh, semi simple and nilpotent parts of each element. So, in particularly this X s is an actually element of G. So, we can assume that uh, G contains semi simple elements that means add semi simple elements. So, if we take X to be a semi simple element X s then look at this uh, subspace span by X s. So, this is going to be a subalgebra of this g and uh, what is the what is special about this subalgebra this subalgebra consisting of only semi simple elements of g so this consists only semi simple elements of g that means add semi simple elements so in particularly uh, these subalgebras actually going to play a big role in the structure theory of uh, semi simple Lie algebras. So, these subalgebras we call them toral subalgebras. So, what is toral subalgebra? So, toral subalgebra. So, it is a subalgebra of G dash. So, a subalgebra, let us call it uh, so traditionally we denote it by H. So, a subalgebra H of this G is called toral subalgebra if it consists only semi simple elements, if it consists only semi simple elements of G. So, we have seen that uh, there, there are some toral subalgebra of G. Since G is being finite dimensional, so we can actually put uh, inclusion as uh, order on this uh, set of all toral subalgebras. So, we can talk about uh, maximal toral subalgebras. Okay. So, we will fix such a maximal toral subalgebra. So, it is a toral subalgebra that is not properly included in any other toral subalgebra. So, that is called maximal toral subalgebra. Okay. So, we will actually fix such uh, maximal toral subalgebra. So, fix H to be a maximal toral subalgebra. So, we will actually work with this H. But before that, let us make one small remark about this toral subalgebras. Okay. If we take any toral subalgebra, so that must be abelian inside your G. Okay. So, this is a small lemma or a small observation. So, what it says? Suppose H dash is actually a toral subalgebra, a toral 
subalgebra of G. So, then this H dash must be abelian. Okay, so, this is very important observation already by definition H dash consisting of only semi simple elements. So, it means add H will be semi simple for each H in H dash. So, add H will act semi simply on G. So, now if we prove that this H dash must be abelian then you can see that this H dash acts on G via this adjoint action diagnosable. Okay, so, that information we will use later for this fixed maximal total subalgebra. So, let us see how one can prove this. Uh, so, we uh, want to prove that uh, H dash must be abelian. So, to prove H dash being abelian, so it is enough to prove the following. Okay. So, here is the proof. So, let x in H dash and then we prove that it is enough to prove add x okay, when you restrict to H dash. So, this must be a 0 map and this is true for all x in H dash. Note that add x is already semi simple element. So, this is being semi simple that implies add x restricted to H dash is also semi simple. So, to prove that add x is actually 0, so it is enough to prove that it has no non-zero eigenvalues. So, we claim that add x restricted to H, H dash has no non-zero eigenvalues. So, how one checks this? By contrary, assume that it has a non-zero eigenvalue, let us call it A and then the corresponding uh, eigenvector you call it y. Okay. So, that means we have the equation of the form bracket x y equal to a y where a is being non-zero. Okay. So, this is uh, by contradiction. So, contradiction by contrary assume that add x h dash has a non-zero eigenvalue. So, that means there exist y in H dash and A non-zero in C such that this equation holds. This equation can be read as follows. So, since this y is actually element of this H dash. So, since this y dash y is element of H dash we know that add y h dash is also semi simple. Okay. So, now if you go back to this equation and then you can read it as follows. So, this is exactly same as saying the bracket y x is equal to minus a y. Okay. So, since add y is uh, semi simple, so given this x can be written as uh, uh, sum of eigenvectors corresponding to this y. So, you write y equal to sorry x equal to. So, since add y is semi simple write x equal to some summation x alpha where x alpha corresponds to the eigenvector uh, correspond to eigenvalue alpha. Okay. So, in particularly if we take this y x then what we get the bracket y x will leave us summation bracket y x alpha, alpha runs over some complex numbers. Okay. So, then you can see that this y x alpha, x alpha is being eigen vector corresponding to the eigen value alpha. So, this y x alpha will be giving us summation alpha times x alpha alpha. In particularly in this equation this alpha must be non-zero. So, whenever alpha is 0 then we get this alpha x alpha is being 0. So, that means this sum this bracket y x should correspond to only the sum of this 
alpha x alpha where alpha non zero. But what is written in this equation if you go back to this equation. So, this is written that the bracket y x is given to be minus a y, but here you have one equation and here you have the equation 2, but both of them actually contradicting to each other because the bracket y x is actually given to be summation all this multiple of x alphas where these x alphas corresponding to eigenvectors different from 0, but here in the first equation this bracket y x is given to be minus a y where this y is clearly eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 0 for the operator add y. Okay. So, this y is an eigenvector for this operator add y corresponding to the eigenvalue 0. So, that actually gives us contradiction because the eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues they must be linearly independent. So, we have the equation minus a y equal to summation alpha x alpha alpha non zero. So, this is a contradiction. Okay. So, this contradiction arrived because we assume that this bracket x y is actually nothing but a y where a is non zero. So, so that forces that a being 0. So, that means add x restricted to h dash is 0 for all x in h dash. So, that implies h dash is abelian. So, indeed this proof tells us that any toral subalgebra must be abelian. So, now we will go back to our maximal toral subalgebra that we have fixed. Okay. We will work with that. So, in particularly this maximal toral subalgebra. So, this also must be abelian. So, this is a maximal toral subalgebra of G. Okay. So, we observe that this is abelian. So, since each element of this H is actually semi simple element. So, that means the add of X is semi simply acts on G. So, H is being abelian we can see that this add x when you restrict x in h, h. So, this acts simultaneously diagnosably on this g okay. acts diagnosably on this g okay. because this these uh, x's coming from this h they all commute with each other and they consisting of semi simple elements. So, now we use this action of this add h on this g and then try to understand how this g splits in terms of this generalized eigenspaces of this action. Okay. So, let us uh, look at that. So, since uh, these uh, elements add x or add capital H okay, add h acts uh, simultaneously diagnosably on this g. So, look at this action on G. So, G can be written as follows. So, G you can write it as some G naught direct sum direct sum G alpha where alpha coming from some subset phi. So, where what is this G alpha? So, G alpha for alpha given in H star G alpha is defined to be those x in G such that when you act this H on this x this is this add action. So, that means the bracket x h sorry h x. So, that must be given by alpha of h x for all h in h. Okay. For each functional alpha in h star we define this simultaneous uh, Eigen space which we call it uh, g alpha. So, which is given to be those x in g. So, when you act this h on x. So, that is given by the scalar alpha of h x. So, it is indeed easy exercise to see that this h goes to this alpha of h is indeed a functional on this uh, h. So, it, it, it must define element of this h star. Okay. So, that is some elementary exercise I will leave it to you to check. So, these spaces that we consider this g alphas. So, they are called root spaces. So, this g alpha 
whenever it is non zero and for those alpha in h star different zero so they are called root spaces and we collect those set of roots so we call it capital pi so what is our capital pi so this is those alpha in h star different zero such that this g alpha is non zero note that g is being finite dimensional implies this capital phi that must be actually finite okay so g is finite dimensional would imply phi is actually finite so this is a finite subset of this h star so this actually indeed possess lots of information about the structure theory of this g okay we will see many interesting properties of this uh, set of roots so this phi is called the set of roots note that this g0 which is defined for the functional zero so it is by definition is those x in g such that this h acts on the x to be zero for all x in h so that means so if we carefully look at it this is nothing but the centralizer of this h in g okay this is the cg of h so which is those element that centralizes this all elements of this h since h is being abelian implies so h is abelian implies this h must be contained inside this g0 this is cg of h so later we will prove that uh, h must be equal to its uh, centralizer okay so that is actually one of the important property of this maximal toral subalgebra okay so later we will prove that h is indeed equal to this cg of h so in particularly we have the following decomposition so which is called either root space decomposition or cartan decomposition so this is called cartan decomposition so the cartan decomposition is obtained by by acting this maximal toral subalgebra on this g okay it acts di simultaneously diagonally so then look at this common eigen spaces for the action of h so then you you just collect them together so that is what gives us this cartan decomposition so g is written as cg of h direct sum direct sum g alpha alpha in phi so this is called the cartan decomposition or the root space decomposition root space decomposition of g like i said later we will prove that the centralizer of this h is nothing but h so in particularly this g not becomes h so this you can replace by h okay so to understand the structure of this g so we need to understand what happens to the centralizer as well as this root spaces g alpha so that is what uh, we would like to do now so before that let's make some elementary observations and then uh, we will proceed with that okay so here is the first proposition so if we take this uh, uh, g alpha and g beta and then take lie bracket between them then that bracket must lie inside g of alpha plus beta okay for all alpha beta in h star so even including zero what we have if we take g alpha g beta the bracket so then this must lie inside g of alpha plus beta so this is the first statement so from this statement it is clear that if we take x from g alpha where alpha is being non zero element then the add x must be nil potent okay so if x is coming from g alpha where alpha is non zero or alpha is in phi so then you can see that this add x that is an element acting on g must be nil potent so this is immediate from the observation 1 because if we take this add x and then if we act it on any g beta where beta is different from alpha 
or even you can include beta to be alpha also not a problem. Then every time you apply add x and this g beta, so then you will end up inside g of alpha plus beta. So now you can only apply add x only finitely many times on each g beta because your space is already finite dimensional. So there are only finitely many uh, powers of add x so that can actually take g beta inside this g of k alpha of beta. Okay. So this implies that add x square for example maps g beta inside g of 2 alpha plus beta and similarly you can see that for any power i if you take g beta then it will map to g i alpha plus beta. But since there are only finitely many i for which this g i alpha plus beta can survive because for various i this i alpha plus beta they are all distinct eigen forms. So, the corresponding eigen vectors will be linearly independent. So, they are all independent spaces since g is itself finite dimensional. So, there are only finitely many i such that this g i alpha plus beta can be non-zero. So, that will imply that for large i we can get this add x power i on g beta must be 0. And now there are only finitely many betas. So, you can choose again i large enough such that this add x acting on this g beta. So, add x power i acting on this g itself is 0. So, indeed 1 is actually immediate from uh, sorry 2 is immediate from 1. So, here is the third statement. So, now if we actually take two elements from uh, this h star and then if you assume that alpha plus beta is actually non-zero. So, then one can prove that in terms of the killing form this g alpha and g beta they must be orthogonal to each other. So, then the kappa of g alpha comma g beta that must be 0. Okay. So, this is again immediate from uh, the calculations. So, let us try to do this uh, calculation one by one. So, let us prove that uh, for alpha in uh, for all alpha beta in h star this bracket g alpha g beta must be lie inside g alpha plus beta. So, let us prove this proof of 1. So, take alpha beta in h star and then take x from g alpha and then y from g beta. So, now look at what is this bracket x y. So, we want to prove that the bracket g alpha comma g beta that should lie inside g alpha plus beta. So, because of that we will compute the action of h on this uh, bracket x y. So, now using this uh, Jacobi identity you can see that this is exactly equal to the bracket h x y plus the bracket x and then bracket h y. So, now because this h is coming from uh, your h capital H, so this h x becomes alpha of h. So, this is alpha of h x y because this x is coming from g alpha plus bracket x comma beta of h y because this y is coming from g beta. So, this is beta of h y. So, now you can see that you can take out this scalar and this scalar. So, that will give us alpha plus beta of h bracket x y. <coughs> Note that this alpha plus beta of h can be 0 or even this bracket x y can be 0. But anyway this equation is true for all h in h. So, that implies this bracket x y must lie inside g alpha plus beta. So, that is immediate. Okay. So, like I said the, the fact 2 actually comes from uh, the fact 1. So, that we have already verified. So, now let us verify the fact 3. So, to verify the fact 3 again we take uh, h from this uh, capital H such that 
alpha plus beta of h is actually non-zero. So, because this alpha plus beta is non-zero that is given. So, then what we do we take x from g alpha and then y from g beta. So, and then compute what will happen to this kappa of x y. So, now we will just use this associativity and then compute what will happen to the kappa of the bracket h x y. So, you can see that this is same as minus kappa of x h comma y and then we can use this associativity then we can write this is minus kappa of x comma bracket h y. So, then you can see that this is minus kappa of x comma. So, the bracket h y will become beta of h y. So, this is going to be beta of h y. So, then this gives us minus beta of h kappa of x comma y. But on the other hand, so this is nothing but alpha of h x. So, this is going to give us kappa of x comma y alpha of h. So, now you put together then what do you get? You get alpha of h plus beta of h kappa of x comma y is indeed 0. Since alpha of plus beta of h is non-zero that is the assumption that we have already made. So, that implies that kappa of x comma y must be 0. So, this proves that the kappa of g alpha comma g beta must be 0 for all alpha beta in h star such that alpha plus beta is non 0. Then it is immediate that as a corollary we get the restriction of the killing form to this g naught must be non degenerate. So, this is immediate corollary you restrict kappa to g naught. So, then this is actually non degenerate. Why? Because if we take some element x in g naught which is actually inside the radical of kappa okay, then what we get let us say x is in g naught and rad that is also inside the radical. So, that means kappa of x comma y is 0 for all y is in g naught. Okay. So, then you can see that kappa of x comma g alpha is 0 for all alpha in phi because alpha plus 0 is being alpha which is non 0. So, we see that this g naught and g alpha that must be orthogonal to each other for all alpha in phi. So, then that implies this kappa of x comma g that must be 0 for all x in g. Okay. So, that would imply that uh, this x is actually inside the radical of kappa. So, this implies this x is inside the radical of kappa. So, that is computed inside g, but we already know that this radical of kappa of g that is actually when is defined on g that is non degenerate. So, this must be 0. So, that implies this uh, radical when you compute with respect to g naught that is also 0. So, that proves kappa restricted to g naught is actually non degenerate. So, if we prove g naught is same as h we indeed prove that the kappa restricted to this g naught that must be actually non degenerate. Okay. So, in some sense that is what we will use uh, in order to prove actually uh, this uh, h is is equal to this cg of h. Okay, so, let me recall one more uh, important uh, fact which is actually very trivial, uh, but it will be repeatedly used in order to prove h is same as the centralizer of h. Okay. So, I will actually uh, stop with this uh, uh, important assertion, maybe I will continue in the next class the proof of this uh, h is being g naught of h. So, here is the fact. So, if we take x and y from this endomorphism of V, assume that x and y commutes. Okay. So, if we know for some reason y is nilpotent, okay, so these are all given 
y is also given to be nilpotent. So, then you can immediately conclude that x y must be nilpotent. In particularly the trace of this x y if you compute that must be 0. So, this is something very trivial uh, to check. So, I will leave it to you to check. Okay. So, this fact again will be used uh, repeatedly in order to prove uh, this the maximal toral algebra is same as its uh, centralizer inside G. Okay. So, this is some ultimate goal uh, that we will prove in the next class. Okay, I will stop here. Thanks.